And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. We're going to look at verses 14 through 20. Um, had it been good to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. And I tell you, right after that song, Brady, just to stop and say, let's just go on with it. But, uh, but we're going to look at God's Word today, and we're going to talk about redemption, about being redeemed, knowing that God has redeemed us. You know, there's two hungers in life, and I'm not talking about going out and getting a Snicker bar, okay, because I know that satisfies us, but there's nothing that's going to satisfy us more than Jesus, amen? You know, there's two hungers in life, there's love and acceptance, Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to be accepted. But there's a second thing. There's satisfaction. Are we satisfied? And what's going to satisfy us? But there's three words of advice that I want to focus on today, speaking of redemption. And that is that we must eat from the bread of life. We must drink from the fruit of the vine. And we must remember our redemption. Remember that we are redeemed. So let's stand in honor of God's Word as we look at Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. This is the observance of the Lord's Supper, and that's what we're going to be doing today. It says, When the hour had come, he sat down, the twelve apostles, with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, giving thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe, that man by whom he is betrayed. Let us pray. Father God, as we come to this time, Father, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts today. Father, I pray, Lord, you'll move me out of the way. You'll use me to proclaim your word, your message. Lord, not my words, but your words, Lord. Father God, I pray, Lord, that you would just use this time. And Lord, as we enter into the time here in a moment of observing the Lord's Supper, the sacrifice, your giving of yourself, the blood that was shed at the cross of Calvary for us, may we not forget May we never forget the ultimate sacrifice of love and acceptance and forgiveness. So Father, now we just pray you'll be with us during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So as we focus, we're going to focus on the first point. And if you're uh, taking notes this morning, you will find your guide there in the bulletin. Uh, eat from the bread of life. You know, Christ has come through the bread of His body to supply our hunger for satisfaction. Let me say that again. Christ has come through the bread of His body to supply our hunger for satisfaction. So when we eat from the bread of life, this is what we, we know. We are satisfied. You know, our sin, as we know, goes back all the way to Adam and Eve. And during that time, Adam and Eve were in the garden. And, and God had told Adam and Eve what not to do. And so let's look together in Genesis 2, 16 through 17. Turn with me there, 16 and 17. In verse 15 it says, And the Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now this was a command from God directly to, to man saying, you can have anything else, but do not eat of this tree. I don't know about you, but uh, I don't know, growing up, if I ever saw signs on the wall that says, do not do this, you know, do not, what does it do? It really makes you want to do it, doesn't it? Please don't flip this switch on. What's going to happen if I flip that switch on? Well, 
if you flip that switch on, you're going to find out what's going to go on. And it may not be what you want to happen. So, but we're conditioned. You see, do not, we want to do it. You know, growing up, you know, we were young, your parents, you know, they tell you, don't do this. What do you do? You want to do it even more, don't you? And the thing is, here is God telling Adam and Eve, don't eat of this tree. Anything else. But as we know, Satan came in and liked to twist God's words and and all of a sudden, Adam and Eve had a choice to make, whether they're going to obey or disobey. And we know in our life, that's our choices too. We're either going to turn and do the things God wants us to do, or we're going to go our own way. So Adam and Eve had this temptation. But what they decided to do was to not do what God said. Look with me in verse uh, chapter 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Oh my. People said, well, Eve really blew it there. No, Adam did too, because he ate it too. We're all in this boat together when it comes to sin, aren't we? And so we look here, and they disobeyed God. What I want to help you understand is this. It wasn't just when sin entered into the world here. But it was this, that God gave Adam and Eve a command. And they did not obey. They ate of the tree that God said not to. You might say this, and write this down. That Adam and Eve were looking for satisfaction apart from God. If they were truly satisfied, then they would have obeyed God. And the thing is this, is we try to, we seek satisfaction in a lot of things that God does not want us to find satisfaction in. There's a lot of temptation out there. You know, as we're talking about um, Wednesday night, about youth being tempted, things that are out there in the internet, things that are in the movies, not just young people, but adults too. And, and we, we see things, we hear things that we're not supposed to be listening to or seeing. But I don't know about you, but it bothers me. When you turn on movies, and I just turn them off, if I even hear the first cuss word, it's gone, that movie's out. Especially when they take my Lord and my Savior's name in vain. I can't sit there, I can't take that. I don't mean it bothers me. And let me just say this, we just say, well, in the world today, that's just the what people say, they just say it. No, but we don't have to listen to it. Stand up for what is right. If you hear somebody saying it, and I've said this before to people, I say, you know what, you're offending me. You're taking my Lord and my Savior's name in vain, and that bothers me. Stand up for the things that are right. Find satisfaction in those things that are true and loving and of God. Here's a key. When we look for satisfaction apart from God, this is what happens. We look for it in the positions of this world. When we look for satisfaction apart from God... We look for it in the places we live, the cars we drive, and the knowledge we possess. Let me just say this. Everything we have was given to us by God. Amen. It belongs to Him. People say, oh no, I worked for that. Well, who gave you the health to work? God did. Who gave you the ability to work? God did. Who provided that money for you? God did. Everything belongs to Him. And what really matters is not what the cars we drive, the houses we live in, how luxurious we live, because let me just say this, when you leave this world, it's not going to matter anymore. What's going to matter is where you stand with Jesus Christ. Whether you know Him, know facts about Him, you must know Jesus in a personal way. But then well, let's look at how Jesus handled temptation. Temptation came to the Lord too. It wasn't just back then when, and it did when Adam and Eve were in the garden, but it also affected Christ before he entered into the, his, uh, his mission of his ministry. Look with me in Luke chapter 4 verses 1 through 4. I'll give you time to turn there. Look with me. Go ahead and turn to those pages. Luke 4, 1 through 4. It says, Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being tempted forty days by the devil, in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become made bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, it wasn't physical bread that Jesus was speaking about here. It was the bread of life. It is the word of God that satisfies us. When everything else won't satisfy us, and we know as, as, as people we have to eat to, to be able to sustain ourselves and to live, we've got to eat. Jesus was hungry here. Satan knew that. Satan knew that Jesus needed food. He was hungry. But what Jesus did is he quoted scripture here back at Satan. And as I said Wednesday night, I'll say it again this morning, that when you quote scripture to Satan, he's going to run from you. He cannot stand the word of God. He knows the word of God. But he flees from it because he does not believe it. And so here was Jesus. But see, here's the difference in between him and Adam and Eve. You see, they satisfied their own desires. But Jesus found satisfaction in his father and he said these words he said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God but here's the second thing not only when we eat from the bread of life we're satisfied but when we eat from the bread of life we are content contentment you know there's time when the Israelites 400 years before they were delivered from uh, Egypt they groaned for God to bring them out of their bondage you know we don't know what that's that's like but you know we are all in a bondage we all have a bondage what is that bondage we have the bondage of sin don't we in our life and until Jesus delivers us we're in agony we're groaning we're saying God deliver me and when you ask Jesus to come into your heart and to be your Savior and be your Lord you have been delivered and as Aubrey was singing, you have been, what? Redeemed. Redeemed. But you know, the Israelites, they grumbled. You know, the whole time, and I, and I know, poor old Moses must have gotten really, ex, you know, exhausted with the grumbling. And hearing them, oh no, you know, we're going to read a passage here in just a moment about how they grumbled about not having food. But you know, at some point or another, we're going to complain. There was a, uh, an, a, an airborne parachute squad that was training new recruits and this one guy he wasn't too bright but they were teaching him how to parachute and uh, okay yeah, that's interesting I don't know where that was but anyway let's move praise on God anyway. praise God anyway that's right amen so maybe there's something Satan's trying to bug me here let's just let's just kick him on out of here he's not welcome but here it is they were getting to doing the uh, parachute thing and I hope that I didn't hit this mic maybe that's what it was my coat hit this thing um, but they were training these people how to parachute. Well, they told this one guy, and he was not real bright, and they said, well, listen, all you got to do is wait for me to say jump, pull the first cord, and if the first cord doesn't work and the parachute doesn't open, then pull the second. You have a backup cord. And then um, the truck will be down to meet you when you land. And the guy was saying, okay, that sounds easy enough. Well, they're up there, and they're going across the fly zone, <laughs> And all of a sudden, he gets up there, and the commander looks at him and says, Jump! And he said, Okay! And he jumps out, and he pulls the first cord. Nothing happens. Oh. He has a sigh, and again, he pulls that emergency thing. Nothing happens. And he says, Doggone it, I bet that truck won't even be down there either. That was the least of his worries, wasn't it? <laughs> the truck. Uh, look with me in Exodus 16, verses 1 through 3. It says, Then they journeyed from Elam. All the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin. Now, that's interesting. The wilderness of sin. <laughs> There's a lot of people in the wilderness of sin today. Amen. Which is between Elam and Sinai. In the fifteenth day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt, then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained, there you go, against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by all with the, the pots and the meat, and when we ate of the bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, 
And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk by my law or not. So here we see, they're out there in the wilderness, they're wandering around, and they're all of a sudden they become to be, they, they're hungry. And all of a sudden they, they begin to complain. Moses, what are you going to do? You brought us out of here. Here they've been complaining to be delivered. They were delivered. And now they just said, hey, I'd rather go back to Egypt where we have food. They've forgotten about where they were. And it's sometimes the way we are too. We forget where we were, once were, before we were redeemed. We complain and we gripe. You see, God gave an answer. He provided for their need, didn't He? So you know what? Sometimes life can be difficult. But God sometimes allows this holy stirring of dissatisfaction. I'm just saying He allows it to happen. Why? Because He wants to see where our faith is. He wants to see if we're going to trust Him. Will we? When those times of doubt come, when those times of uncertainty come, and they will, when sometimes the doctor gives a diagnosis we don't want to hear, and those feared words sometimes, that C word of cancer, that strikes our heart's cord, and He says, I don't know if you'll make it. And we have to depend on God. God is there through it all. I know that's easy for me to say, isn't it, when I'm healthy. But the thing is, God will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He will be there with you through it all. And folks, that's got to give us comfort and peace. That's got to. And sometimes life is going to be difficult. God created us for satisfaction. He knows that we are most happy when we are satisfied by Him. Let me say that again. God created us for satisfaction and He knows we are most happy when we are most satisfied by Him. But now let's move to the second thing. Drink from the fruit of the vine. The Bible tells us that God purchased us from sin by the sacrifice of Jesus. A sinless man. A man who knew no sin. A man who didn't even think. That, that's hard to comprehend. You would think at some time this was a man, but it was God, that Jesus would have even some kind of a, a bad thought or something, or evil thought, but no, nothing. Even through all the temptations that Jesus went through, never thought and even said to those who were killing Him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's hard to comprehend, isn't it? That kind of love. But see, when we drink from the fruit of the vine we find atonement. What is atonement? I want to read a passage. 1 Peter 1, 18-19. We're moving around in the Scriptures. That's okay if you don't want to turn there, but just listen. It says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You know, that's, and it says, the hymn says, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Here's a key. Intimacy with God completely depends on the blood of Christ. Let me say that again. Intimacy with God completely depends on the blood of Jesus. Why? Only the blood makes us acceptable to God. So when we take of that cup, when we take of that blood, when we take of that broken body of Christ, we do this in remembrance of Him. The redemptive work of Christ covers us. It cleanses us and brings us back into an intimate fellowship with God. I'm going to say that one more time. The redemptive work of Christ covers us, cleanses us, and brings us back into an intimate fellowship with God. You know, we're commanded to take of this Lord's Supper. Why? Because we do it in remembrance of Him. But not only does the fruit of the vine, not only does it bring atonement or atonement with God, but it brings a sanctification. When we're sanctified, that we're set apart. We're called apart. And Jesus, let me just say this. Some people I hear this say all the time, said, I'm not anybody. Let me just tell you this. If you have that feeling today, I want to say this to you. You are a somebody. 
Why? Because Jesus made you somebody. If you belong to Jesus, you do belong and you are somebody in Him today. Find courage and strength in that. So now I want to move to this last point before we observe the Lord's Supper today. To remember your redemption. You know, to remember your redemption is to take a look at the Passover meal. If you go back to the Old Testament days and you read Exodus 12, verses 3 and 8 and verses 14, you'll find this. It says, there were three elements that they observed. The unblemished lamb, which symbolized innocence or purity. Then they took of the unleavened bread, or the matzah, as they called it. And that symbolized purification from sin. And then the bitter herbs then symbolized the bitterness of their slavery in Egypt. So this meal basically was commemorating the Israelites' deliverance from their slavery. But if you see the symbolism and you direct it now to the Lord's Supper uh, that we just read about a little while ago in Luke chapter 22, and you see a lot of the same symbolism. We still see the Old Testament symbols as related to the New Testament. See, Jesus came for a new way. He brought a new covenant. We don't live by the Old Covenant. Thank you, Jesus, that we don't live by the Old Covenant. If we were still living in the Old Covenant, we'd be going to a priest and he'd be having to sacrifice a, a, a lamb for us and, and pour it out upon the altar, go through all those, those things. And see, some people are living in the Old, old Covenant. We don't have to. Through Jesus, he's not only the high priest, but he was the spotless, unblemished Lamb of God. Amen? He became that sacrifice for you so that you don't have to live by the old ways. But thank the Lord that you can live by the New Covenant. It's not about anything about us, but it's all about Him. But you know, the disciples must have been confused. You see, when He shared about these symbols, He said this, do this in remembrance of me. That's what the choir sang this morning, in remembrance of me. The disciples, I don't know if you thought for a moment, they probably asked this question, Jesus, why do we have to remember? Why, why, where are you going that we have to remember? What are you saying, Jesus? And he told them again. They didn't fully understand it still. Here was, the, here was the time when Jesus was about to be betrayed. This was the time when they were going to come with torches and, and come to take Jesus away. And he was going to go through that mocking trial and, and then eventually be nailed to a cross and, and, and face agony. For all of mankind, and they were still asking the question, Jesus, why do we have to remember? And I believe in his own way with saying this right now, guys, you may not understand, but one day you will. And so as brothers and sisters in Christ, we do as the disciples did that night as they gathered around, and he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this, eat of this, take this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he lifted it up and he blessed it and he said, he said, for, the, for my sin, for, for, for my blood that was going to be shed for you, for your sin on the cross, drink of it. Drink of it, all of it, in remembrance of me. I don't know about you, but I, you know, I look at the disciples and the doubt that they had, but I'm to say that I probably would have doubted too. But the thing is this, that as, as, as believers in Christ, we remember the sacrifice. And so that's why we take of the Lord's Supper. That's why we do this. That's why it's not just something we just do to do it. No. It's because when we do this, we remember the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. So we take of the bread. We take of that cup. But what I want us to do right now and the men, I'm going to ask them to come on forward here in a moment when we begin to pray, is I just want us to bow our heads where we are. I, I, we're not to take of the cup unworthily. So would you bow your heads with me? Just close your eyes. What I want us to do right now is I want us to examine our hearts and our lives. If you're here with, with maybe some unconfessed sin, maybe there's something you're carrying this morning, a burden or whatever, I want you just to, to lay that before the Lord. Say, Lord... I don't want to take of this Lord's Supper unworthily. So just pray right now and ask Jesus to forgive you. And he has, but ask Him. For... So do that right moment in just the quietness of this moment.
Father, thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. As 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. the word of God, they went out singing a new song. But I just don't want us to leave right yet. There might be somebody here this morning that maybe in the sound of this, this message today, that maybe you have, a, uh, Lord has laid something on your heart, maybe you want to come down and pray. Maybe you want me to pray with you about something. And I'll be standing here if you'd like for me to pray with you. Or maybe you've, you've never asked Christ to come into your heart. I want to give you that opportunity right now to say yes to Jesus. Whatever it is, we're going to sing just two verses. No one comes, then we'll be dismissed. Father God, I just pray for this time of invitation. Lord, And as we've taken of the Lord's Supper, I pray, Lord, we, we go out rejoicing. But Lord, right now, I pray for that one, or, or more, Father, that, that has some need this morning. Maybe they're hurting in a way, and they just need somebody to lift them up in prayer. Or Lord, maybe there's someone here that doesn't know you as, as Savior and Lord. Lord, I pray that right now they'll just come down this aisle and say, you know, I want Jesus. I want Him to be my Lord and my Savior. So Lord, we give this invitation time to You. Will You move in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have Thine own way